theyeshiva.net. So we're in the middle of the Maimer of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, V'yitin l'cha tovshin chav ches, V'yitin l'cha halikim, a Hasidic discourse that was said on the, at the Fabrengen of Shabbos Parshas Toldos, the Shabbos before the month of Kislev, the Shabbos that blesses Kislev, Tovshin Chavches, which would be the end of 1967. And it focuses on the Pasek, it begins and focuses on the Pasek, with which Yitzchak begins giving the blessings to Yaakov, who he thinks is Esav, Hashem should give you from the dew of heaven and from the fat of the earth. So in the first year, which was last Monday, we spoke a lot about the name of Eleikim, and why these blessings come from Eleikim, V'yitan l'cha Eleikim, when usually in Torah most blessings are associated with the name of Yudke Vofke, like in Berches Koyanim, the priestly blessings, which by the way, in Rashi, this question is raised, why it says Eleikim, and Rashi gives a whole explanation. It's actually in many Chumashes, it's in Rashi in small letters, because I think it's, it's not in all the manuscripts of Rashi, but the question is a is a it's quite an, an ancient question. Why the word the name Elikim is used, and he spoke a lot about that with Avram Avinu and Yitzchak Chesed and Gvura and so forth. <coughs> I'm not going to repeat that. You could learn it inside and review it because I don't want to. Uh, when I repeat, I get stuck often in the repetition. But that was the first three chapters focusing on that. How the bracha from Gvura is more intense, and yet the bracha and that was the bracha Hashem gave Yitzchak after Avram's death because the system of the world changed from Chesed to Gvura, but yet the bracha that Yitzchak gives Yaakov, he wants to give Esav and ends up giving Yaakov, is even deeper than that bracha of Ayvorech Elikim Es Yitzchak B'nai. And then beginning from Siv Dalet, the Maimir went on to start explaining the deeper element of why Yitzchak wanted to bless Esav, even though he was not naive, and he knew that Esav does not mention Hashem's name in his conversations, as we explained, and, proved, and it's how the, the Chazal explained why, how Yitzchak identified that it's the voice of Yaakov, wasn't just the physical voice, the Ramban says that uh, the twins, they sounded alike, or Yaakov really had that ability to, to, to mimic Esau's voice. So it wasn't the physical voice of Yaakov, but rather the style of language, you know, the way somebody speaks, you know that this, is, this has his or her imprint, and Yaakov mentions Hashem's name, Esav doesn't, so Yitzchak knows this. So if he knows that Hashem doesn't mention, if he knows that Esav doesn't mention Hashem's name, why does he want to bless him with these great blessings? And the Rebbe explains, based on Torah Ur from the Balatanya, and this is based on the teachings of the Arizal and many uh, teachings in the Kabbalistic literature, that Yitzchak saw that Esav contains very lofty sparks, very profound holy sparks. And by blessing him, he would accentuate, he would reveal, he would bring to the fore those, those inner latent energies of Esau. Because a blessing is not just saying nice words, but it's really bringing forth a great light, an Ur Elyon, accessing and drawing down a great light, which we understand this even within our own world, our own relationships, that by, when you bless somebody, meaning when you see their goodness and you accentuate it and you talk about it and you, you help them see it. So by you believing in them, you help them believe in themselves. So Yitzchak here wanted to really bring forth a light that will help illuminate Esau that he should be able to see himself in a new light. But there was a challenge. And this challenge Rivka understood very well. And that is, if this light would have been drawn down on Esau, not through Yaakov, one of two things would have happened. Either it would have been swallowed up in him, meaning it would have been completely absorbed to the point that it wouldn't be recognizable. It's like in the story of Pare, Pare's dream where the lean cows swallow up the fat cows and uh, you don't recognize that they were ever there. That would be one option. The example I gave was, you know, you give money to somebody who needs recovery and you want to help them, and you really want to help them, but they're not in a state where they can receive that help, and they would just squander the money to buy more uh, destructive substances. The other option would be, it would be so effective that Esau would become a spiritual zombie. 
his whole identity would be obliterated, it would be nullified in this great light. You know, he would become so holy that he wouldn't exist anymore. <laughs> there would be no Esav. Which, of course, you know, you can undo the world and everything will be holy, but that's not the objective. In order for Esav to be sublimated, it has to happen through Yaakov. Through his relationship with Yaakov. And it may happen over, it happens over a long period of history. So Hashem orchestrated that Yitzchak should bless Yaakov, so that these great lights, Tal HaShamayim, Hashman should go to Yaakov, and ultimately through that he will elevate the sparks of Esav. That was chapter five, 4. What did chapter 5 explain? What is this great light that elevates the sparks? So this is a very deep idea. People had a lot of questions on it. I'm going to try to explain. But let's, let's summarize what we learned. It says in, in Kabbalah and Chassidus that in Klippa, things are, number, things are orchestrated in num, the number 11. In Kedusha and Holiness, it's 10. And that's why when they burned the incense every morning or afternoon in the Beis HaMikdush, there were 11 herbs, 11 herbs that were ignited and their aroma went up. We enumerate those 11 every single morning. Some Nusach uh, Svard, you do it twice before Shachris and at the end of Shachris, right before Aleinu. It's an important piece in davening because those 11 herbs represent... 11 forces connected to unholiness. And we want to elevate all of the 11 as they're known, the 11 crowns of impurity. Why 11? If God orchestrated the world, that the building blocks of the world are 10, not 11. So why do we say in holiness everything is 10? Not 9, not 11, it's 10. Of course Hashem could have had 11, could have made 20, could have made 100. (laughs) But he chose 11. They're known as the 10 spheres, the 10 building blocks of the universe, the 10 building blocks of the soul. I got it. So why unholiness number 11? The answer is because, and this is very, very important to understand, and if you, do, if you don't review the previous class, because this you really have to integrate, and I'll get it, because in klipa, which means unholiness, we also count number 11 because we also count the divine life that vivifies unholiness. Everything comes from Hashem. There's no reality in the world that's not receiving its animation, its vitality, its existence, and its continuous existence from the Rabbi Nishalayim. Like we say in the davening every morning, va'ata mechaye eskula. You give life to everybody and to everything. But there's a difference between Kedusha and Klippa, and this is the key. By Kedusha, the definition of holiness is integration. The definition of klipa is dissonance. Okay? Important statement. <laughs> Kedusha is integration. Klipa is dissonance. Cognitive dissonance and all forms of dissonance. Why? Because if klipa wouldn't experience dissonance, it wouldn't be klipa. <laughs> if you're aware that you're connected to infinity, so then you're not klipa. The challenge of klipa is it doesn't know who it really is. In other words, there's a dissonance between me and me between me and who I think I am, right? And essentially, all dysfunction is that. (laughs) I wasn't planning to talk about trauma today, but uh, what is trauma? Trauma is you don't know who you are. You really don't know who you are, right? One of the better definitions of trauma that's given today is that your core beliefs about yourself are damaged and they impair your productive functionality in this world as a dignified citizen of humanity. It may have happened because of one event, it may have happened because of an accumulation of events. Trauma doesn't just mean that something challenging happened to me. It means something challenging happened to me or is inside of me, may have not happened, you know, maybe epigenetics, but it compromises a very core belief about me, you know, I'm, I'm damaged. If you would know me, you would never be my friend. I am essentially, essentially unworthy. Now, these are things we may not be conscious of, but they may be driving so much of my habits or instincts. I may be binging on food constantly between chocolate potato chips and black and whites because of that. It's an escape of that very, very profound um, notion that is deeply embedded. But what's the point of it? The point is there's a complete dissonance between the truth 
You're not damaged. What do you mean you're damaged? The, 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 the Gemara says, the Mishnah says in Sanhedrin 38 that a person, as I say, the whole world was created for you. So God created the whole cosmos for a damaged, uh, for a damaged hopeless loser. But it's my core belief. You could quote to me a Mishnah from today till tomorrow. It's not verbal. It's not that philosophically you came to a conclusion that you're worthless. People don't come to that philosophical conclusion. At least it's very rare. <laughs> they have people who have reached that conclusion philosophically, you know. Kohela struggles always with the vanity of the universe and the vanity of a person. But I'm talking here about something that really convinced me. I may have been there in fifth grade. I asked a question and everybody started to laugh. Or I was bullied and I felt like, you know, and everybody laughed. And as a result of that, I have been crushed and I'm still crushed. I don't tell myself today it's because I was bullied. It becomes already my belief. It's not anymore connected to the bully. And it's so important because people who are, don't, were not impaired by this don't understand it. But what's the common, what I'm trying to bring out is this is all part of Klippa. You know, we talk about Klippa as some mysterious evil. It, it's not just evil. Klippa means anything that covers up your true vibe, your true music, anything that eclipses your glorious divine reality is klipa. Any thought, any word, any action, any habit, any addiction, any behavior, any instinct, any emotion that eclipses and denies and belies the truth that you are a derivative of divine love and oneness is covering up your true identity. There's a dissonance. The definition of kedusha is transparency. Therefore, in Kedusha, the divine energy is integrated. That becomes my identity. That's why it's holy. That's what holiness means. Talk about Shabbos. We say Shabbos holy. What does it mean it's a holy? It's a more transparent day. The inner holiness of the universe is more manifest than on the day of Shabbos. You say a holy place, a holy item, a holy person. What does it mean a holy person? Ish Kadosh. Ata Kadosh Vashim You say it's a holy person. <coughs> The, the Shana, Shunamite woman, Isha Hashunamis, in the Haftarah of uh, Chayisara, speaks about Elisha, Ish Kaddish. We know that he's an Ish Kaddish, a holy person. There's transparency. There's no blockage. He, he or she is a conduit for the divine. So by definition of Kedusha is that the divine energy is integrated. It vivifies in a conspicuous and revealed way the holiness. Because there's no dissonance. That's why it's holy. It identifies itself as a manifestation of divine oneness. But in Klippa, if it was integrated, it wouldn't be Klippa. Klippa means that it's concealed. The divine energy is completely not integrated in a way that Klippa identifies with divinity. Because if it would, it wouldn't be Klippa. Klippa means it's a cover-up. What allows for the cover-up is that the divine energy is aloof. It, in, in, in Kabbalistic and Hasidic language, it's called makif. In Kedusha, the energy is pnimi. Pnimi means it's integrated. It's internalized. Makif means it hovers over you. The word makif means it surrounds you. But we're not talking here in spatial terms, surrounds you. We're talking here in existential terms. Surrounds you means it's not internally integrated, so you're not conscious of it within your conscious self. It affects you but it's like a superconscious reality. It's known as keser. It's the crown above the brain. You have the brain, the conscious brain. Keser is the superconscious brain. In other words, that's what's happening in my brain that I'm unaware of. It's very effective. In fact, what is superconscious is much more effective than what's conscious because it's much more powerful. But I'm completely unaware of it. I may spend my whole life not being aware of it. Why? Because my conscious brain never uh, detected and became aware of it. There's a dissonance. That's why in Kedusha there's so much self-awareness. In Klippa there's little self-awareness. Self-awareness is the idea of transparency. You could see what's happening. So in Kedusha everything is ten. Why? Because the reality or the person is one with the divine energy. And the divine energy is categorized, choreographed in ten. Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gvur, Teferes, Netzach, Malchus. 
conception, comprehension, application, love, um, boundaries, strength, empathy, victory, gratitude or submission, bonding and confidence, leadership, royalty. Those are the ten building blocks of the universe. Everything is made up of all those of, of each one of the ten. It's like the spiritual chemistry of the universe. The, 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 the spiritual cellular structure. However, the divine energy is completely one, so there's ten. But in Klippa, the energy of the divine that animates it, it's called Sitra Akhra, the other side, can't be integrated. Because if it would be integrated, one of two things would happen. Either it wouldn't be Klippa, or the energy would be completely swallowed up and it wouldn't be able to do its job. So it remains above. So you count it separately. So you have number 11. You have the 10. The 10 attributes of Klippa, the 10 crowns, but you have the 11th crown, which is the divine energy. Now, this is not about numbers. This is about a very deep understanding of Klippa. So this means that Klippa has something that is superior to Kedusha. Because in Kedusha, the divine energy is condensed. It's limited. Because it's in- integrated with structure. In Klippa, the divine energy remains above. It never has to integrate because it can't integrate because it wants to animate the Klippa. So it needs to allow for the Klippa to do its own thing, to be its own thing, to function as a Klippa, as a shell, as a husk. So in many ways, the divine energy of Klippa is much higher because it has that infinite, bohemian, uninhibited component to it which lacks all structure. There's something very uh, intense about it because it doesn't go through filters because it remains above. Great question. Why when the energy of of, of Elikus, of godliness, is integrated in Gdusha, does the energy not get swallowed up? And the answer is because Kedusha is about being a conduit for that energy. The definition of Kedusha is that the I is part of the divine I. Any thought or word or behavior that is basically a manifestation of the truth, that I am an ambassador of the divine in this world, I am an ambassador of love, light, hope, compassion, authenticity, wisdom, healing, redemption, that is holiness. Holiness is the experience of oneness. I am part of oneness. All arrogance, insecurity, and unhealthy toxicity and fear is the experience of loneliness, separateness, detachment. And the worst, the Torah, the first thing the Torah says is not good, is it says that God saw the world every day, he saw the creation and it was good. Every day, good, 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 good. Friday, very good. Tuesday, two times good, because there was no good on Monday. Every day, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Wonderful. And then, the next, the next chapter, God says, there's one thing that's not good. What's the first thing Tyre says is not good? It's not good for man to be levade, alone. Detachment. Today they call it attachment disorder. As childhood, we have attachment disorders. The attachments that I needed, I didn't get. The caretakers who were supposed to give you that experience of attachment, the four S's, to be seen, to be soothed, to feel safe, to feel secure, I didn't get. So I'm trying to compensate. But this is not just a psychological idea, it's also a very deep spiritual idea. We are attached, and therefore we crave attachment. It's not just an evolutionary idea because we have evolved and the only way we could survive is through teamwork. So therefore embedded in our brain is the need for attachment and when there's the attachment disorder, we can't function well. It's not just a random mistake because of evolution because the foragers could only survive when they were together. It's a very deeply, from a Jewish perspective, it's a very deep spiritual idea. Attachment is so important because that is who we are. We are attached. And the more attached I am, the more individual I can be. Because the more attached I am, the more confidence I have, the more I'm at peace with me, so that me could be me. 
I can be I. I can fulfill my unique function and be the unique derivative of God's light, the way it's manifested through me or through you or through every individual in their own unique way. So Kedush is all about attachment. It's all about dveikus, his kashras. Dveikus with yourself. Dveikus with other people. Dveikus with your loved ones. Dveikus means oneness. And dveikus, of course, with the core of reality, with Hashem. Kedush is about dveikus. Where there's oneness, there's Kedusha. Where there's achtus, there's Kedusha. Right? It says by Yaakov, there were 70 souls, but they're considered one. Nefesh achas. By Esav, not. There's multiplicity, there's fragmentation. Why? Because the closer we come to the source, the more we identify with our source, the more we recognize our oneness. It's also true in science. The deeper science get to the the deeper science and physics and astrophysics and cosmology gets to the core of reality, the more we recognize the oneness of the universe. If I look at the universe from a surface perspective, everything seems separate, fragmented. But if you study chemistry and you realize everything is made up of similar building blocks. Right? If I look at myself and a banana, I'm very different. I like banana, but I'm not a banana. I'm not an elephant. I'm not an ant. But if you get to the DNA level, if you study DNA molecules, you see that we share 50% of DNA with a banana. In other words, there's achdus habriya. The bria is one. And the deeper we go, the more oneness we see. Because the more you go away from the layers, the cover-ups, the more transparency, the more oneness. So in Kedusha, the divine energy doesn't have to get swallowed up and squandered. It's like when you give money to the healthy person, he'll go to the doctor. He won't use it for destructive things. I spoke before about Esau. Why? Because the divine energy is what makes you tick. It's who you consciously are. So you don't swallow it. On the contrary. It becomes your identity. But in Klippa, if the energy was integrated with it, one of two things would happen. Either Klippa would cease to be Klippa. It would just dissolve in nothingness. Like we said before, the brachas could have caused Esau just to melt away in ecstasy and there was no Esau left. Or the other way around. Esau would swallow it up and there's no Kedusha, there's no Chiyos left, there's no energy. So the divine energy always remains aloof, separate. And Klippa knows super subconsciously that it's connected to it, but it has no way of identifying with it. So it completely distorts its own reality and identity into thinking that it is what, it not, what it's not. And God is still giving it chiyos, but that chiyos is number 11 because it remains aloof. You understand the baron? Yeah. There's ten, there's, ten, there's 10 building blocks, and every single one is a conduit. There's chesed, there's chachma, bina, das, chesed, gvurit, eferes, netzach, No, no, all klipa. He's saying all klipa gets its energy from Hashem. But if the energy was in a revealed, integrated way, the klipa wouldn't be klipa. Either the klipa would swallow up the energy and it wouldn't be able to live from it because it would just dissolve and get lost, or the klipa would cease to be klipa. In order for the klipa to be klipa, the divine energy that animates it remains aloof. It, re- it hovers above it, so to speak. I don't mean spatially. I mean existentially. It's not consciously aware of what gives it life. Because if unholiness would be aware of what gives it life, how can it be unholy? Right? What allows... T- t- let's talk about it psychologically. What allows a person to be able to go on living with core beliefs that are, that are broken, that are fragmented, that are erroneous is because there is a dissonance, there is a separation, there is a mechitza between who I really am and who I think I am. And sometimes my whole life I live in that, in that bubble. It's a bubble. All klipa is a bubble. It makes me biased. It makes me fearful. It makes me insecure. It's what self-consciousness is. We often spoke about self-consciousness. Yes, yeah, some of you will understand this very, very well. <laughs> what is self-consciousness? I mean self-consciousness in a... In a, in, a real, in a way that impairs, it impairs me or impairs you. It's like coming into a, to an event and you can't be there. Because all I'm thinking about is, right, what they're thinking about me. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? You come into a shir, you come to a bar mitzvah, you come to a chasana, you come to a sheva brachas, right? They say that in Eretz Yisrael, the self-consciousness levels are better. Because there's more kedusha there. Reb is that true? I don't know that you lose it completely. I don't know that you lose it completely. But that's what they say, that in Eitz Yisrael, 
it's a little better. That's what Rabbi Nachman writes. <laughs> Lekutei Maran. <laughs> so, no, my point is, when somebody's experiencing self-consciousness, I'm in a bubble. I'm stuck. I like, get me out of this place. The problem is, I can't get out of this place because it's my thoughts. <laughs> and I'm like trapped in them, right? And when I get out of it, <laughs> I'm just getting out. I'm trying to get out. You know that feeling? You're trying to get out of it. But it's like pulling yourself up by your hair. <laughs> you're never going to pull yourself up by your You're not going to be able to pull yourself up by your hair. You need somebody else to take you out of it because the thoughts that I'm trying to employ in order to get out of my self-consciousness, those thoughts are stuck in self-consciousness. <laughs> so when you're using thoughts to get out of self-consciousness, you just perpetuate the prison. So I, I become in a bubble. I'm like locked up. And for those of you who experience what I'm saying, you know how difficult it is because what are the tools to use? If I use those very same dysfunctional tools, I remain stuck in the same place. So here is, so here is right. So think good thoughts, but sometimes the experience is pre-verbal. So I have to go to a place that transcends thoughts. My brain is not going to be able to do it. Sometimes that's where you have to shut down your brain, your conscious brain, because it's, it's driving you crazy. You just can't go to that place. In Kashrus, we have an experience, an idea, the way it came in is the way it goes out. So if it came in from a pre-verbal space, it's not going out through verbal uh, conversation. So now, so now, yeah. So that means nothing else can also help the, the situation of Esau? Oh, 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 good, good. That's a good question. So Esau has tremendous sparks. What was the so, so, so what's our relationship with Esau? So here's the point. Esau has that number 11, and remember that that's the superior quality of Esau of Yaakov. Because the divine spark in Esau has a certain infinity to it, because it never came into structure. Its flaw becomes its virtue. Right, Klippa has a certain intensity that is bohemian, that is infinite, that is un, un, uninhibited, because its relationship with the divine is number 11. Now, what about holiness? Does holiness have number 11? Does holiness have number 11 or not? Of course, we call it keser. That's keser. It's called atik. It's the makif. But there's a difference. By kedusha, number 11 is not what gives life to the 10 spheres. Because the 10 spheres, the life of the 10 spheres are integrated in the 10. So it's number 10. Number 11 is completely aloof. It's independent. So it's not counted with the 10. In Zoyar, there's an expression, antu chad you're one, and it's not part of the cheshben of the calculation of ten. That's keser. But in sitra achira, the makif is what gives it chiyus. So you have to include the makif in the number, because without the number 11, it doesn't have any vitality. Kedusha, the vitality goes into the ten. And the 11 is completely beyond. So now, how does Kedusha bring out the holiness of Esau? How does Yaakov find the holiness of Esau? There's only one way if he finds his own number 11. If Kedusha cannot find its own number 11, it's never going to be able to excavate and bring out the Kedusha of Esau because the Kedusha of Esau is in number 11. So if Yaakov goes to Esau with the 10, it's never going to find the Makif of Esau. So Yaakov has to find the number 11 in him. And that's why the Bracha of Yitzchak to Yaakov is v'yitam l'cha l'kim mital ha-shamayim, the dew of heaven. Which in Zoyer it says that's Atik, the dew of heaven represents Keser, because if you want to excavate the sparks of Esav, you have to access your own number 11, which transcends structure. Now this is a very profound point, so I'm going to illustrate, I'm going to try to bring it down now, what it means in life, in real relevant life, so we'll, we'll be able to understand what this means. We have our friend from uh, Pakistan here. Welcome. She always begins her comments saying how beautiful and real. Thank you. It's good. So 
the holiness, I'm, I'm quoting a question on Zoom. So the holiness of Klippa is really untouched because it remains above and it's not distorted and it's never integrated into the 10. So therefore it remains pure. Yes, very true. Is this the idea, is this, the, is this connected to Soiva versus Mamale? Yes, it's connected to Soiva versus Mamale. Mamale is integrated, Soiva is Makif. Absolutely. Next question, is the whole point to integrate the divine into the ten spheres and ultimately become one with the divine by elevating the ten spheres? Does that mean that Klippa gives something to Kedusha because it challenges Kedusha to go to number 11? Absolutely, you're getting it. Good. Next question, it's like one... It's like if one is unconscious of the existence of Hashem and all of a sudden Hashem, somebody sees Hashem, either you will die of a heart attack or you will become, it will be an utter shock and you're going to go into a coma and you're going to melt away into nothingness. <laughs> yes, okay. So let's now, let's now go to the next step. There's a story... To, to explain this, is a story that the Lubavitcher Rebbe shared, Yud Beis Tamos, Tov Shin Chav Beis, summer of 1962 out of Habrengen. And the story is very relevant to understand this point. He told a story that, uh, he told a story that uh, it was once of Habrengen with the Rebbe Rashab. He heard the story from his father-in-law. There was Habrengen with the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, and a chassid asked the rashab, "Vos is a chassid? What is the definition of a chassid?" So the rebbe, the fifth Lubavitcher rebbe, responded to him, "A chassid is a lamtenishtzik, a lamplighter." And he explained that in the shtetlach, in the olden days, there was no light, but they had on the streets they had poles, pillars, and in the pillars there was the ability to light up a wick, a lantern. And there was somebody at night, somebody hired by the city, by the shtetl, by the municipality to go. He had a big staff, a stick, and on top there was a fire. And he would light all of these lanterns so there was brightness at night in the shtetl. It's called a, uh, in, in Hebrew they call it a pansai, somebody who, who's a lamplighter. Ah. Right, right. So uh, the Rebbe said, that's a chassid. A chassid is somebody who walks around with that fire, with that flame, and he lights up, he lights up all the lanterns. That's his job. In other words, every soul is a near Hashem. Every soul is a potential, is really a flame of Hashem. But sometimes it has to be kindled. So that's a chassid. So this fellow asked the Rebbe Rashab, he said, what happens if, uh, if the lantern is in a desert? So he said, so you go into the desert and you light it up. So he says, what happens if you don't see it? You don't see the potential for the light. So he says, that's because of your own crassness. If you would be more refined, you would see the light in somebody else. So he said, you have to work on yourself. So he said, and what happens if the person is in the ocean? So the Rebbe said, the Rebbe Rashab said, you go to the ocean, you take off your clothes, you jump in, and you light them up in the ocean. So the man looked at him and said, Dos is a chassid. <laughs> That's a chassid. So the Rebbe went into a meditation, the Rebbe Rashab, for a while, and he picked up his head and he said, yeah, das is a chassid. That's a chassid. Now, it's a very, very deep story. I'm not saying it exactly, I don't remember exactly all the details, the way he said it, but this is the thrust of it. But what, what was his point? So the Rebbe explained one of the points, that's what I want to bring out here. The person says, what if the lantern is in the desert? What does it mean it's in a desert? And a desert means that sometimes it's a place where there's no civilization. It seems like the person is beyond hope. They're lost in the wilderness. So he said, you go to the desert and you light it up over there. But what happens if the person is in the ocean? You can't light a fire in the ocean. 
<laughs> if you light a fire in the ocean, it's going to be extinguished, right? You put a, li- a wick and a flame in the ocean, you're not exactly going to have a fire. So he said you have to jump into the water. But he said you have to first take off your clothes. And the Rebbe explained as follows. If I want to save somebody in the water and I go in with my clothes, it's not going to work. It's going to impede your ability to swim and navigate your body in the water to save somebody. Sometimes there's no choice. But you take off your clothes and you jump in. What did the Rebbe mean by that? So the Lubavitcher Rebbe explained that what the Rebbe Rashab meant was as follows. Sometimes when somebody is drowning in the water, if I go in with my clothes, with my garments, I'm not going to be able to touch them. I have to take off my garments. What does that mean? Garments, he says, represent the structure of a person's life, the way I present myself. But these become my comfort zone. These become the way I dress. People have the way they dress, the way you carry yourself. Or to put it more abstractly, the way you see yourself, the way you identify yourself. If I'm going to go into the sea with those garments, I'm not going to be able to accomplish what I want to accomplish. Why? Because the person who's there doesn't have a relationship with that style, with those garments. They won't get it. They won't understand the language. He says, you have to be ready to take off your clothes and get to your own etzim, get to your own core, get to your own soul core. And then your core will touch his core or her core because the core they have. It can't be a relationship based on garments. It has to be a relationship based on your beer self. Your beer self means the self that is unaddressed and not camouflaged and not decorated with all the garments. That's an example of what we mean by number 11. What does this mean practically? There's a therapist here in Muncie. He comes to a lot of our shiurim. So he told me once that there was a teenage boy who was struggling. And he came into therapy, to the therapist with, with his father. And the father started to speak about the boy's schedule. The, the therapist told me, I'm laughing, you'll see why. So the father is telling the boy, he says, learn from me. I wake up six in the morning. I have a shear. I learn. I go daven. After davening, I go to work. I put in a productive full day. At the end of the day, I feel good. I feel accomplished. And that's the beauty of having a structured day. And why don't, why don't you emulate that? <laughs> Wake up early in the morning, put in a good day, it'll be a fulfilling day. Instead, you schluff and you sleep till three in the afternoon. You do nothing. You waste your night. If you would only have a good, meaningful, structured day, then your life would be so happy. So the therapist tells me the boy looks at his father and he says, (coughs) it was obviously coming from pain, but the thrust of what he said is, wow, you're teaching me something brilliant that I don't know. That if I wake up early and I put in a full day of study or prayer or work, I'll have a structured day. Do you think I don't know that? <coughs> that was the end of the conversation. And he laughed off everything his father said. Now what happened over there? The father meant well. The father was encouraging his son to emulate him. Right? There was one challenge. What's the challenge? Put it in the words of this mimer. The father wanted to remain in the number 10. He couldn't go to number 11. You're not going to be able to speak to this boy if you don't go to number 11. Obviously, there's something in your structure that's not working for him. It's very nice to tell, to tell, to tell somebody, just get into a structured life and everything was going to be amazing. But there's something in your structure that's just not working for him. Completely not. There's something broken. There's something not functioning. You know, tell the car, 
just drive. Or tell the person running the marathon, just run. The problem is his leg broke. So learn from me, I'm running. You also run. It's great if both legs are working, you encourage the person to run. You give them an incentive. But if a leg is broken, if your car broke down, you tell them, just drive. I can't drive. Learn from me. All I'm telling you is basically that I don't know anything you're going through. I don't understand you. I don't tune into you. This is where Klippa, where Esau challenges Yaakov to go out of himself and take off his own garments to find the number 11 within himself. As long as my holiness is defined by structure, which is amazing, by the ten spheres, it's beautiful. But you'll never be able to help Asa find the holiness within himself. Because your holiness will not speak to his holiness, because his holiness is rooted in infinity, because he is number 11. Only when I have the courage, and it takes a lot of courage, to connect to my own number 11, which means I have to go out of my own comfort zone, and I have to find the Godhead which transcends the ten spheres. In simple English, it means I have to take off my garments and jump into the water with my etzem, with my core. Then I can trigger the Kedusha that is in you. As long as I want, you should come down to my level. You should accommodate my level. You should come close to my level, which means look at the beauty of 10. Everything is structured. Everything is categorized. I won't speak to you because your your idealism is rooted in number 11 and you know it. And you know it. So you need the infinity. So Kedusha gets elevated through Esau. Esau needs Yaakov, but Yaakov also needs Esau. Esau needs Yaakov because Esau is lost. Esau is broken. But Yaakov needs Esau because Yaakov on his own is number 10. And Esau challenges Yaakov. Esau challenges Yaakov to find his own keser, to find his own superconscious, to find his own transcendence. If you want to put it in more, in, 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 in relevant language that's very relatable to many people today, is sometimes when a family has somebody who deviates from the family structure, that child helps the parents grow in a way that nobody else would help the parents grow. Because you're forced to say goodbye to the religious structure that was functional and working, but now it stopped working. And because it stopped working, if you're going to remain stuck in that place, you'll never be able to reach that child. So you have to go to a much deeper place in yourself. You have to strip yourself from every element of ego, including a spiritual ego. And every element of a comfort zone where godliness becomes structured in your schedule and personality, you have to say goodbye to your old God and welcome a new, infinite, true, pure, unadulterated, undiluted, divine infinity which touches your essence. You have to get in touch with that and then you could touch your child's essence or somebody else's child's essence. And we resist this. We want to remain in our comfort zones. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Huh? Rabbi Litzman doesn't know what I'm talking about. Okay. (laughs) I get it. I hope somebody knows what I'm talking about. Every real relationship demands this work, no question. But in order to, but especially when you're in a relationship with somebody who's struggling. And that's what Esav represents. Esav is very holy. And Yitzchak knows that holiness. But Esav's holiness is not integrated within him. That's the tragedy of Esav. You know, it says that Esav, at the end of his life, he was beheaded and his head was buried in the bosom of Yitzchak. Targum Yonasim ben Ozil Parshas Vayechi. You know that. His body was buried in the field near the cave in Hebron. But the head of Esav is in the cave of Yitzchak. That means, who's buried right near, Esav, right near Yitzchak? 
Esav. In the bosom. Yaakov is buried in a separate plot. But you know there's a halach in Shulchan Aruch, Yeridei, Shin Samach Beis. You're not allowed to bury a tzaddik near a Russia. You're not allowed to. There's a story in Tanakh, in Melachim, Melachim Beis Yud Gimel, chapter 13 of Kings 2, I think, that there was a false prophet, and he died, and the Jews were dug, digging, were, were uh, preparing a plot for him to bury him, and troops of Moab came in to uh, take booty to steal Jewish grain, and the Jews were afraid that they're going to they're gonna beat them or kill them. So the corpse of this false prophet, they didn't have time to give it its own burial plot. So they cast the corpse into the cave of Elisha the prophet. And this corpse touched the bones of Elisha. And he was a big Russia, this pro- false prophet. And he was resurrected, and he walked out of the cave. And he fell somewhere else, and they buried him somewhere else. So the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Daf Mem because Hashem did not want a Russia buried near a tzaddik. So there was a miracle of resurrection, so that Elisha should remain, uh, Elisha should remain uh, untouched. Esav, his head is buried right in Yitzchak's in Yitzchak's bosom. What happened? The answer is, the head of Yitzchak represents number eleven. The superconscious, the higher brain of Esav. The core of Esav is holy, it's sacred. It's right near Yitzchak. It's one with Yitzchak. And that's why Yitzchak wanted to bless him, so that Esav should be able to find unity. He should be able to find his holistic, integrated Kedusha. The tragedy is there was separation, there was a separation on gulf between Esav's head and Esav's body, between Esav's higher self, superconscious self, and Esav's manifest itself. When Esav cries, why did Yaakov take away the blessings? Those tears exist on two levels. They exist on the level of, here's a thief who takes everything from me, but they also exist on a deeper level. He's crying for healing that never happened. Why did I have to be this person? Why do I have to be this criminal? There's that inner soul of Esav that weeps and says, I wish I could have been somebody else. In other words, I wish I could have been who I really am, but I don't know who I really am anymore. You have to be able to hear those tears of Esav. The Gemara says, the famous uh, explanation of the Ruzhiner, that Mashiach is going to come. The Gemara says that uh, that Mar- the Mardachai's tears in Shushan was because of Esav's tears uh, in Eretz Yisrael. The Rishon says Mashiach, Mashiach is going to come when Yaakov is going to dry up Esav's tears. What does this mean? Mashiach is going to come, you hear? When Yaakov is going to dry up Esav's tears. What it means is, every, everybody is holy. Ya- Esav is also holy. There's the famous Vilna Gon, Ves Yaakov Sanesi, Ves Esav Sanesi. It's the S of Esav that I don't like. It's the Tuffle of Esav. It's the body of Esav that becomes disconnected from the head. But Esav is also sacred. And Yaakov needs to dry up those tears. That's why Yitzchak gave him the blessings. For Yaakov to dry up the tears of Esav, Yaakov has to find his own infinite godliness. And to make it very, very real, we have an Esav inside of us, everybody. We have the Esav inside of us. The Esav inside of me is the part of me that is filled with that dis- It's the part of me that is broken, that is fragmented, that experiences dissonance, that experiences dysfunction and trauma. And I'm not going to heal that part if I'm just going to come from a place of number 10. You have to go to a place of number 11. It's like when you're dealing with that child or with that nephew or with that niece or with that student or with that other person who is broken, who is fragmented, and you insist that you're going to remain within your comfort zone and let them, let them come close to you and you're going to lose them. You have to be able to strip yourself from all your garments. You have to discover a Yiddishkeit that is not defined by your spiritual structures and comfort zones in order to be able to trigger number 11. You have to find the God that is infinite. Now this is very, very, somebody says, please be practical. I don't know how I can be more practical. Either you get it, maybe you have to think about this a little more. But the real point here is that it's so easy to become, what's the word? To become smug 
This is who I am, and this is how I function, and this is how I operate, and this is how I'm going to connect to you. And I'm not ready to go out of that. I'm not ready to transcend that. And you know what? It works for me because I'm in a very holy environment, and in Kedush, everything is integrated. But you'll never be able to touch the spark of Esau, and in that sense, you will also remain in prison. Esau needs you, but you also need Esau, because he helps you find yourself. There's an amazing word from the Alter Rebbe that... Uh, it's an amazing word from the Alter Rebbe that when Yitzchak tells Esau to bring him the food, he says, bring me the food, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. So Esav tells, uh, so Esav goes to bring the food. When Rivka repeats the words of Yitzchak to Yaakov, she adds words that her husband never said. She said that her husband said, Hashem. I'm going to bless you before God. Yitzchak never said that. Yitzchak never said that. He said, I'm going to bless you. Rivka quoted him wrongly. She said, he said, I'm going to bless you before God. So Rashi says what she meant was that God is going to agree to these blessings and it was maybe Rivka's way of explaining to Yaakov why it's so important to get these blessings because God is going to endorse them. The Alter Rebbe says in Torah in this Maimah that the Rebbe is quoting something much deeper. Lifne Hashem means before God. It also means Lifne is before, above, like something that comes before there's Lifnei Hashem, there's Yudkei Vavke, and then there's Lifnei Hashem, there's beyond Yudkei Vavke. The ten spheres come from Yudkei Vavke. Rivke is telling Yaakov, this brach is Lifnei Hashem. It's higher than Yudkei Vavke. This brach is from Atik, Mital Shamayim. It comes from the infinite transcendence. That's why Esav is getting this blessing, because Yaakov needs to reveal number 11. So it's coming from Lifnei Hashem. And therefore, Yaakov, if you want to be able to take these blessings and give them to Esav, you have to go lifnei Hashem. You cannot only connect to Hashem through Yutke Vavke, which is through the structure of the ten spheres. You have to become a keli. You need the bittel. You need the humility to be able to go out of your own divine structure and open yourself up to the true experience of infinity, because only then will you be able to be the one who transmits these blessings to Esav. If you will remain stuck in your Yudke Vavke, even though it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's holy, it's godly, but you'll never reach the Lifnei Hashem, you will not have a relationship with these blessings. This is so, this is so profound because you see in the morning we say, every morning, we speak about the 11 herbs, right? You remember? And what's the last statement? If you took away, if you didn't put in one of the herbs, you're deserving of the death penalty. I always wondered, really, the death penalty? Why? Because he didn't put in, it's like I tell you, you know, make me an egg, okay? I need in the egg pepper. I need some vegetables. I need some cheese. I need some salt, a little butter a little spices, and if you if you delete one of the ingredients, you get the death penalty. Okay, so I understand it's not my breakfast, it's Hashem's, Ketiris. Fine. So you're missing, you put in 10 herbs, <laughs> and you're missing one of them. Chayev Misa. The pshat is, v'im chiser echad If one of these is missing, Chayev Misa. If even one, because it's done, there's 11. And number 11 is what gives the chiyus to all of them. So if you take out one, you deprived the energy from the klippa. You took away their life force. Because it's that number 11. If you took out one, that number one, that which is number 11. You took away from it its energy. You took away from it. You gave it a death sentence. If you deny from the clip in number 11, you, you gave it a death sentence. Chayev mis. And each one is essential. And it's not just number 11. It's all of them. Each one is essential to its functionality. In very, very realistic terms, this means that in every situation that I confront 
that I'm confronted with in life, especially situations that are difficult, situations where I'm confronting Esau, the last thing you want to do is lock yourself up in your bubble. The last thing you want to do is put on a bulletproof vest and go like this and don't let anybody close to you. I understand the emotion. We want to resist anything else because we want to fortify ourselves and go back into our comfort zones where we're going to be safe. But that's very, very destructive. That it's, uh, that's coming from your own ASA, from your own trauma. What you have to do is you have to allow for openness. You have to allow your heart to get open. You have to remove the bulletproof vest. You have to tune in to the tears and to the cry of Esau. You have to be able to identify the holiness, the sparks in Esau. And then you have to let that touch you in your core and go out of, all, go transcend a godliness that is filtered through your finite tools and open yourself up to the divine calling right here, right now, in relationship to this person. You have to ask yourself, not what God can do for me, but what I can do for God. And not what you can do for me, but what I can do for you. And it's easy, it's not not easy, because if I'm the lifeguard, I want to sit on the throne and say, get out of the water. But as the Rebbe Rashab said, you have to take off your clothes and jump in. And when I take off my clothes, I don't recognize myself because I always walk around with these clothes. You know, I have my tie, I have my suit. I have to let my vulnerable core emerge in the relationship. And when that happens, Esav has turned you into the person you were capable of becoming. Esav allowed you a much deeper relationship with Hashem. Before Yom Kippur, I sent out a story. There was a clip I sent out. I sent it in one of the shiurim, I think. There was a Jew here in Muncie. Some of us had the privilege of knowing him, Rabbi Ronnie Greenwald. You remember Rabbi Ronnie Greenwald? And he once went to a hotel for Yom Kippur. There was a program for Jews for Yom Kippur. And right before Kol Nidre, there was a group of teenagers. <laughs> Let's call them ex Hasidim, who arrived to the hotel. Simply they wanted a place to chill on Yom Kippur. They didn't realize that there's a whole program there and a whole minion there. And Ronnie spent most of Yom Kippur either at a swimming pool or in the lobby with teenagers who came from religious homes. They were drinking beer. But he spent the Yom Kippur with them. Not that he probably davened in his room when he can. But, but he spent much of Yom Kippur with them. That's an example for this because, you know, most people would say, I can't give up my Yom Kippur to be with these guys, you know? Let them get their act together, it's Yom Kippur. But he understood that you have to take off your clothes and jump into the water. Who says what Yom Kippur is supposed to look like? Maybe God wants that you should spend Yom Kippur at the swimming pool. So you say, nah, 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 it's not Jewish. It's not structured, like it's Jew to Jewish structure. It's not communal life, but it's authentic. That ability is the ability of real flexibility where you don't worship an image of Kedusha. You, you worship God, you don't worship religion. That's the difference. In number 10, you can worship religion. <clears throat> now some of you still don't understand what I'm saying. So I'll say something else. The next time somebody says something to you, And your initial reaction is to attack, to criticize, to explain to them how wrong they are. Try to resist it. Try to resist it and really watch why you have to respond that way. Are you responding that way because you really, really feel this is what's going to help them? Or you're responding this way because you were caught off guard and you're feeling threatened. The moment you're responding a certain way because you're feeling threatened, it means you're in prison. And if you're in prison, better not to respond. (laughs) If you can get yourself out of prison, your own prison, then you respond not based on what 
it's going to make you feel more comfortable or what you feel is the right thing based on you being so uncomfortable and queasy, but really tune in what they need at this moment. This is an example of going out of your structure and tuning into something much deeper. Now, here we're talking about a holy structure. We're not talking about here, the ten spheres are not arrogant, the ten spheres are holy, but still, they define God in a limited way. And to touch Esav, you need number 11. And that's what Rivka said, Lifne Hashem, we got to go beyond Yud Kevavke. Okay, we're going to take a break here. And we'll continue, and I hope to finish the Mimer by the next year. And, uh, and uh, we'll bring it all together by Ezer Hashem. So that's going to be Thursday morning, 7.30 a.m. Somebody asks, is this the concept of Mesiris Nefesh? Yeah, in a way, what does Mesiris Nefesh mean? Mesiris Nefesh means, doesn't only mean to kill yourself. Mesiris Nefesh means surrendering your soul, surrendering your structure. Surrendering what you experience as your identity and opening yourself up to God's calling of you, which is always much deeper. It's your real identity. It's your infinite identity. Yeah. That's what real self-transcendence is. It's, it's responding from a very deep place of freedom. You get it? It's responding from a very deep place of freedom. A deep place of freedom means I do not respond from a place where I'm just trying to guarantee that I am good, I'm comfortable, I'm safe. I don't need to, I don't need to. If you need to, then you can't jump into the water. But the real lifeguard could take off the clothes and jump into the water and go into that place. You can ask a question about it or anybody. Listen, you want to do, you want to communicate in a way that speaks to the other person. You never want to alienate the other person. Now, you have to always be careful because some people can take this wrongly and say you could start breaking halacha, go out of structure, and uh, you could break the halacha, right? You don't have to follow God's structure. So you have to be very careful with this. He's not talking here about the structures of halacha that a person has to follow. Because the ten spheres are ultimately where it's at. But halacha itself can become a trap. It becomes all about the structure of halacha, not the infinity of it. You understand? We need structure. We need structure in our lives. Structure is not bad. Structure is very good. But structure is a tool to get to infinity. You can't use structure and turn it into a trap that just keeps you, uh, 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 keeps you cloistered and, uh, and, and, and you become allergic and you become defensive and you become dismissive and you become judgmental. When your structure is divorced from number 11 from Kesser, so your halachic life, your ritualistic structured life is severed from pure infinity. And then there is a smugness that sets in a certain arrogance, a certain holier-than-thou attitude, a certain judgmentalism, a certain dismissiveness. Fortunate is the person who never allows number 10 to become divorced from number 11. The finite is a tool to access infinity. The structure is a tool to go beyond structure. So you need structure because if there's no structure in life, there's chaos. The bohemian life that's not based in structure becomes chaos. That's why we have shachris, mincha, mairev, time for kriyashma, time for davening, right? There's Shabbos, there's Yom Tif, there's morning, there's night, the sun rises, the sun sets. It's very important. It's the rhythm of life. It's like a body. If you tell your body, no structure, just chaos. Every cell, do whatever you want. You're dead. The lungs have to do what the lungs do. And the, the, right? and the urinary system needs to follow the urinary system and the digestive system. If the digestive system suddenly confuses its role with the respiratory system or with the circulatory system, what happens? We're dead. Right? The sequence of DNA is meticulous. And if somebody says, who cares about structure? <laughs> we'll just change the sequence. That change of sequence wreaks havoc. And that's the idea of spheres. So, so this has to be understood. Don't misunderstand this. Spheres is a divine structure. But Hashem is not defined by structure. He's beyond it. 
Structure is the way godliness expresses itself in the world and expresses itself in a person's life. And the tragedy of Klippa is that it has that number 11 that's not integrated. But that gives you the challenge that the structure becomes a tool to always be able to touch infinity. This is based on the Maimah Torah Eir, Re'ei Re'ach B'ni. The Rebbe explains it here, but it's based on that Maimah. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.